Slavoj Žižek, Ecology and Its Discontents. Today, even for most considered to be part of the radical left, the notion of big change to our economic, political, and social order is an impossibility. To radically change the way we live is impossible. At best, we can simply incrementally change our current system. Anything too radical will inevitably lead to disaster. Anything contrary to our liberal capitalist order can only result in authoritarianism, tyranny, and chaos. Even though Fukuyama has since modified his end-of-history thesis, its content has permeated the public consciousness to the degree that we do live in capitalist realism, as described by Mark Fisher. Today, even the most radical political thought is more often than not limited to improving the liberal capitalist order to make it more sustainable, more inclusive, less racist, less sexist, and so on. Zizek fundamentally rejects the notion that liberal capitalism is the pinnacle of social organization. The Fukuyamian notion that it is will be a fundamental roadblock that will prevent us from adequately addressing looming threats such as climate change. To circumvent this obstacle, Zizek seeks a partial rehabilitation of the revolutionary terror exhibited by Robespierre in the French Revolution, Mao, the Bolsheviks, and even the fascists. For Zizek, there was a kernel of truth in these events that is obscured by our liberal, democratic, or Fukuyamian consensus. He doesn't want to diminish the legitimate criticisms of these historical events. His goal would be quite the opposite. For Zizek, these systems were simply not radical enough, and the terrible outbursts of violence exhibited in them are evidence of such. The violence they demonstrated was an impotent response to their inability to actually enact the radical social change they desired. In Zizek's own words, the true aim of in defense of lost causes is not to defend Stalinist terror and so on as such, but to render problematic the all-too-easy liberal democratic alternative. Zizek characterizes these historical mistakes as, quote, right steps in the wrong direction as to allow us to not reject revolutionary terror in its entirety, but to reinvent it as we will be required to if we want to adequately address the ecological crisis. Quote, While these phenomena were, each in its own way, a historical failure and monstrosity, this is not the whole truth. One should be careful not to throw the baby out with the dirty water. Although one is tempted to turn this metaphor around and claim that it is the liberal democratic critique that wants to do this, say, throwing out the dirty water of terror while retaining the pure baby of authentic socialist democracy, forgetting thereby that the water was originally pure and that the dirt comes from the baby. What one should do, rather, is throw out the baby before it spoils the crystalline water. We can be quickly oriented to Zizek's overall critique with the dominant mode of ecology under liberal capitalism with the chapter title Unbehagen in der Nature, as it is a reference to Freud's Das Unbehagen in der Kultur, which can be translated as civilization and its discontents or the uneasiness in civilization. In this work, Freud articulated a fundamental tension between society as a whole with its rules and restrictions on us as individuals and our innate desires as individuals to be free and autonomous. In a similar vein, Zizek suggests that embedded in the very idea of nature is in part what is producing our current ecological crisis. Just as for Freud, the framework of civilization plays a fundamental role in producing the symptoms to be treated by the analyst, Zizek suggests that it is our very conception of nature that produces the symptoms we see in the ecological crisis. Beyond Fukuyama For Zizek, the traditional Marxist conception of the working class as a single, unified, revolutionary subject no longer applies, but that doesn't mean all hope is lost. Zizek is still a Marxist and refuses to abandon a politics of universal emancipation, as such, he wants to replace the working class as the objective and materially determined negation to capitalism with the excesses of capitalism exhibited in the ecological crisis, the development of slums, new forms of technology in areas such as genetic engineering, the inadequacy of intellectual property, and so on. <laughs>
How precisely does the ecological crisis present a fundamental antagonism to global capitalism? They do so as they signal an end to capitalism's infinite capacity for self-reproduction. Historically, capitalism has exhibited a seemingly infinite malleability, with the ability to turn any catastrophe or antagonism into a place of prof profitable investment and commodification. Capitalism is able to subsume any sort of radical critique of capitalism and turn it into yet another consumer product. Carbon emissions are killing the planet? Here, buy a Tesla. Feel bad about being a mindless consumer? Here, watch Wally. -E. But, fortunately, for anyone who desires a post-capitalist world, and unfortunately for those concerned about the ecological state of our planet, the very nature of the ecological crisis precludes this sort of solution. We're not going to ethically consume our way out of a problem created by consumerism. To this point, capitalism's success has relied upon the invisible hand of the market, a mechanism that combines every individual's egotistical behavior up to a net benefit for the common good. As Zizek describes it, quote, Up until now, historical substance, history as an objective process obeying certain laws, played out its role as the medium and foundation for all subjective interventions. Whatever social and political subjects did, it was mediated and ultimately dominated and overdetermined by the historical substance. What looms on the horizon today is the unprecedented possibility that a subjective intervention will intervene directly into the historical substance. No longer can we rely on the safeguarding role of the limited scope of our acts. It no longer holds that whatever we do, history will carry on. For the first time in human history, the act of a single socio-political agent can really alter and even interrupt the global historical process. To illustrate this point, Zizek makes note of a skirmish that occurred during the Cuban Missile Crisis on October 27, 1962. On this day, an American destroyer dropped depth charges in an effort to compel a Soviet submarine to surface, an act which, provided the three officers aboard the submarine agreed, warranted sinking the American ship and even launching their nuclear missiles at land targets. A shouting match ensued amongst the officers, where two said yes to the idea of launching the nukes. They were already convinced that World War III had begun. To not launch them would be a dereliction of duty. One officer said no. The man who declined, Vasily Archipov, undoubtedly saved humanity through his restraint. This example is a paradigmatic case of how we've reached a point where a single person's choice could trigger nuclear war and or environmental collapse. Or, conversely, prevent nuclear war and or environmental collapse. A single person's mistake, or even well-intentioned act, could release some biological agent from some secret lab that subsequently ends life as we know it. It's now quite literally easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. There are two primary ways in which one can proceed when they understand such knowledge. People can adopt the politics of fear or a politics of emancipatory terror, Zizek wholeheartedly embracing the latter. The politics of fear is by far the dominant framework embraced by those interested in ecology, even for those on the left. Most environmentalism operates trapped within a framework of fear, fear of catastrophe either initiated from human action or naturally occurring. This politics of fear has a disingenuous dimension to it, though. It, on the surface, presents as advocating for sweeping change, as having the courage to do whatever is necessary to avert disaster. But, in reality, the politics of fear has a better chance of developing into the predominant ideology in service of global capitalism, as it can replace religion's fundamental function of having unquestionable authority and that which can impose limits. We should start treating our earth with respect, as something that is ultimately sacred, something that should not be totally unveiled, that should and will forever remain a mystery, a power we should trust, not dominate. This dimension to an ecology of fear clearly illuminates the lack of a radical emancipatory project embedded within it. 
This takes the mask off of the radical facade to reveal a deeply conservative structure within popular ecology. Quote, it is this distrust which makes ecology the ideal candidate for the hegemonic ideology since it echoes the anti-totalitarian post-political distrust of large collective acts. Just as a run-of-the-mill liberal will be distrustful of any political project that will rock the proverbial Fukuyamian boat, that any such shift will undoubtedly end in gulags or mass graves, the ecologist of fear, too, distrusts any sweeping change, though it is precisely the ecological crisis which necessitates radical change. This obscured conservatism is seen clearly in the shared hostility towards scientific breakthroughs in genetic manipulation exhibited both by conservative religious leaders and environmentalists, for whom this sort of thing is simply a step too far. It's humans getting too big for our britches. It's humanity trying to intervene where only God or capital N nature ought to be able to. In this view, God or capital N nature created the best of all worlds, and any attempt to intervene with it is like Icarus flying too close to the sun. This sort of view, though, is fundamentally flawed. Nature itself is a catastrophe and not some perfectly balanced order. Evidence for such can be seen in the primary catalyst for our current ecological crisis in fossil fuels. Oil and coal themselves are a product of cataclysm and mass death beyond our wildest imaginations beyond anything humans have ever seen. Nature has always been in a perpetual cycle of mass chaos, followed by relatively brief periods of relative stability in which life attempts to recover from the cataclysm. In lieu of a politics of fear, Zizek would embrace a politics of emancipatory terror. A necessary condition for a politics of emancipatory terror would include, quote, Accepting the fact of the utter groundlessness of our existence, there is no firm foundation or place of retreat on which one can safely count. It means fully accepting that nature, qua the domain of balanced reproduction, of organic deployment into which humanity intervenes with its hubris, brutally throwing its circular motion off the rails, is man's fantasy. Human activity is obviously the problem, in a certain sense. Human activity could certainly lead to catastrophe if we don't change human activity. But what is also certain is that if all human activity stopped today, the result would be equally catastrophic for life on Earth. Imagine all the animals who have evolved for countless generations to live in proximity to humans. Even beyond pets like cats and dogs, imagine the death on an incalculable scale that would take place upon the disappearance of humanity for animals who live off our scraps and waste. Everything from pigeons, raccoons, to the squirrel who eats birdseed on my porch, to the bacteria which live in our guts. All of these beings would undoubtedly face mass death on an unimaginable scale if humans stopped, quote, intervening in the environment today. To complicate matters, the solution to our current ecological crisis cannot be a sort of new age return to nature attitude, where if we simply return to our rightful place as subservient to nature, the ship will ride itself and all will be well. This is a paradigmatic example of a politics of fear. The ecological problem we face isn't that we have become alienated from nature, that we have distanced ourselves from the world. It's delusional beyond measure to think that the city dweller who has never seen the Milky Way is somehow disconnected from nature. As such, the return to nature trope is misguided from the start as they attempt to create a schism between what humans do from nature. They falsely hope that if we simply worship nature and revere nature as God, it will reward us for our faithful service. As Zizek describes it, quote, This very relationship of faith with reality itself is the main obstacle that prevents us from confronting the ecological crisis at its most radical. It is our commonsensical, natural attitude, the attitude which results from our normal life, that would preclude us from truly accepting that the flow of day-to-day -day life could really be disrupted. When you look into the sky, you don't see a hole in the ozone. You just see a serene blue sky. When one is out engaged in nature, it's easy to forget how fragile and contingent everything one is seeing truly is.
When I've been in nature, I'm more often than not enamored by the grandeur and engaged in what I'm actually doing. The last thing on my mind is being concerned about mass extinction or the rapidly changing climate at the hands of human action. The only time I've had this spell broken was during my time living and working in southeast Alaska, where you can literally watch the glaciers receding at the rapid rate. This, too, is a feeling that can easily be interrupted by transporting oneself back to the immediate moment by being engaged with what you're actually doing. The sense of impending doom coinciding with the rapid melting of glaciers which formed over tens of thousands or millions of years can only occupy one's mind upon moments of reflection. Once you re-engage with your environment again, whether it be deciding where to put your feet on a hike or searching for a handhold while climbing, that sense of doom disappears. Engagement with our life world and nature precludes us from adequately engaging with the ecological crisis. Illustrating this point, Zizek describes how surrounding the ruins of Chernobyl, to this day there are a handful of farmers who simply carry on with their work as they did before the catastrophe. They just ignore the abstract and incomprehensible talk about radiation as they are subsumed in their life world. Beyond that complication, the solution to our current predicament also cannot be a rejection of the common sense life world in favor of, of a supposedly cold and uninterested science and technology attitude. While it must be noted that Zizek's gripe with the scientific attitude isn't that they're detached from the life world, that they live in some sort of bubble separated from the lived experience of everyday life, but the way that this attitude of detachment joins forces with the worst elements of our life world experience. Scientists perceive themselves as rational, able to appraise potential risks objectively. For them, the only unpredictable, irrational elements are the panicked reactions of the uneducated masses. What scientists are unable to perceive is the irrational, inadequate nature of their own cold and distanced appraisal. To be clear, Zizek's problem, as well as my own, with science isn't that science as such. Science is amazing. And there's definitely no way we can proceed without using science. The problem here is in how science functions in the social order and as an ideological institution. This function is to be the final arbiter of truth and certainty, effectively replacing such role that the church played in times past. Just as we cannot place capital in nature upon a pedestal of worship in hopes that our reverence and respect can act as a guarantor of balance and order, science too cannot act as this big other. What is to be done? For some scientists, they understand complex systems such as our ecosystem as both being extremely vulnerable to disruption and enormously resilient to shocks. These shocks can be accommodated, but only up to a tipping point, which, if crossed, will cause system collapse, leading to a new order. But, regardless of the seeming endless stream of data on the matter, we cannot really know where such a tipping point will be for us in regards to climate change. We will only know for certain once we've passed that tipping point, and it's far too late to do anything about it. This can be illuminated in Bernard Williams's notion of moral luck, where he describes the case of an aspiring painter who abandons his wife and children to leave for Tahiti in order to develop his artistic genius. For Williams, the question of whether this was an appropriate action or not can only be answered after the fact, only after we know whether or not he became a great painter. Similarly, with the ecological crisis, we will really only be able to assess the moral standing of our actions to prevent climate change, or mitigate it, after the fact. Quote, Either we take this threat seriously and decide today to do things which, if the catastrophe does not occur, will appear ridiculous. Or we do nothing and lose everything in the case of a catastrophe. The worst choice being that of the middle position taking a limited number of measures, in which case we will fail whatever should happen. To illustrate this point, Zizek draws on, quote, Rumsfeldian epistemologies, unknown unknowns. Not only are we not sure where the tipping point will be, we don't even know precisely what it is about the tipping point which we don't know. The solution to this is paradoxical. 
We ought to, in a sense, admit defeat and ad- acknowledge that the crisis is already here. It is unavoidable. Our future is doomed. During the Cold War, many bemoaned the success and expansion of the Soviet Union as evidence that the fall of the West was imminent, that the battle was already lost for capitalism and liberalism. But, as Zizek suggests, quote, It is precisely their attitude which was the most effective in bringing about the collapse of communism. In Dupuy's terms, their very pessimistic predictions at the level of possibilities of linear historical evolution mobilized them to counteract it. We should thus ruthlessly abandon the prejudice that the linear time of evolution is on our side, that history is working for us. In order to defend a cause which is lost, one must accept the hopelessness of the battle they are fighting. Who else could be more dangerous in a war than one who acts as though their life is already forfeit? In conclusion, we ought not let the monstrous failures of the 20th century dissuade us from embracing the necessary radical change. Radical change that would be required if we were to succeed in addressing the climate crisis. We should take these failures and learn to fail better. Accept that the crisis is already here, and use such predestined damnation as a vehicle to find salvation. And while any sort of rehabilitation of radical politics will undoubtedly produce cries of authoritarianism or incoherent screeching about gulags, as in these times, it's far easier to embrace the security and seemingly safe waters of the supposed end of history. I'll lazily quote Zizek and say, I don't give a damn about my opponent. I'd like to say thanks for watching. Zizek's texts are dense and enormously complicated, and while I won't pretend to have captured the entire essence of In Defense of Lost Causes, or even the final chapter, In Behagen in Der Nature, I hope I did them some level of justice. If you can and would like to support the future production of these videos, and become part of an exclusive reading group, support me on Patreon. If you're interested, check me out on Facebook and Instagram for extra content. Links below. Again, thanks for watching.